good afternoon everyone i take india welcome all the participants for today's regional distance learning seminar session today's topic is palliative care for adults and children with hiv and the speaker is dr anwar parvez sayed dr anwar parvez sayed is a public health specialist he is an affiliated clinical associate professor at the department of global health of the university of washington and also a doctoral candidate in the global health leadership program he is currently working as a consultant with the department of communicable diseases who emro we welcome you sir for today's session and request you to start the session thank you shweta <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon everyone it's very nice to be here and thank you uh, everyone for joining in so as shweta mentioned today's uh, uh, dls is or uh, is about palliative care uh, in hiv honestly speaking i am uh, taking this uh, session or facilitating this session after a long time uh, because this is something which we uh, as uh, practitioners at art centers have have not are not seeing this uh, as commonly as we what we used to see before uh, when i was going through these slides uh, from naco i actually remembered my time in uh, in gstm tambaram chennai when i was a fellow uh, in in hiv fellowship program it was almost like 15 years before and and why i'm sharing with you all uh, is because that was the time when uh, we had very few art centers in the country and in fact there were just two art centers in 2004 uh, one was in gstm tambaram for entire south india and one was i think in in yeah one was in jj hospital mumbai and so patients used to travel long distances to reach art center for uh, to receive art and slowly this scale up happened and now we have art center like more than one art center in almost more than each district uh and and that was the time when uh, there were a lot of patients who used to be hospitalized for many opportunistic opportunistic infections uh like pcp cryptococcal meningitis toxoplasmosis so in tambaram we used to have a pediatric ward where we used to have all obviously like pediatric patients and there were almost seven or eight wards where all hiv positive patients were admitted in fact like there were more wards where there were tb patients and, and those who know and have seen tambaram uh sanatorium so you you know better than me i, I think um uh, and and that was the time when there were patients who used to be uh patients were started on art based on their cd4 uh count uh and and also those who were having cd4 less than 200 only those were eligible for art in others we used to delay art initiation and there was one ward in the hospital which we used to call that ward as in palliative care unit or palliative care ward so when we used to see patients in all other wards and if there was a patient who was very serious and where art was not working or very serious serious opportunistic infections or maybe like encephalitis which viral encephalitis which we uh, were, like were failing to manage or all those terminal patients used to be like moved to that ward um just keep this in 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 the background when i am going through the, through these slides because as art medical officer working in the art center you may not be seeing these patients and obviously you don't see these patients these days uh, unless until you work in some hospital which sees this kind of patients uh on the other hand uh, as a like a every or many of you might be having this personal experience also uh, of dealing with patients who are uh, terminally ill or maybe like having some cancers and maybe like uh in 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 bed since 6 months or more and then you see them dying so many of you might have gone through all these things and might have experienced what diffic how difficult it is to care for these terminally ill patients and and when you talk about palliative care in hiv it is a bit different than other diseases but when it comes to end of life care it is all, it is almost same so the basic purpose of this entire exercise is to uh, make death easy uh, in terms of like having when when we deal with the terminally ill patients and also uh, 
uh, which is one thing which is specific with HIV is that it starts from the day of diagnosis. So because there is no cure for HIV and patient lives with this infection uh, throughout his or her life, we provide all those things which are necessary uh, to, for, for those patients, which can be, which, which are not necessarily uh, uh, needing med medications as such, but uh, will need other kinds of support like psychological support, social support, and, um, uh, and, and, and maybe like after death and bereavement kind of support. So <clears throat> let's go through these slides also, like uh, uh, which will be mostly giving you details of the things which we can do in, in, in different situations of patients. Uh, so this will is kind of a deck which you can all, always refer to when you have uh, these specific patients in front of you and you can pick and choose from these slides, uh, like which medication can be given, what time, and 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 what is the dose, frequency, and what are the options available. So this is that kind of presentation. So I'll not like bore you with uh, like reading slides and each and every word on this slide, but I'll try to uh, share some experiences and also uh, highlight on those specific areas, which I think you should be aware at the back of your minds, like when you see the patients in outpatients, there will be some patients who will require this kind of uh, treatment and care, uh, which you may not be able to directly provide. But as a leader of the ERT center, I think it is responsibility because patient is registered under your care. We need to uh, make it possible for the, for the patient to, to be able to access what the patient needs. Uh, in his or her uh, stage of uh, disease. So we'll talk about uh, different things or different stages uh, in, the, in the palliative care and, and what are those important things which are required in adults and pediatrics. Basically, those are uh, similar but not same. Uh, there are few specific things which are uh, additionally important in, in pediatric uh, patients, which we, I think, need to see. And then uh, home-based care, which is uh, very uh, important and uh, in our country it's it's uh, uh, like everyone has some solution for in, uh, for 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 every disease right so uh, i think the principle should be that will not that do no harm should be the principle i guess so whenever we are providing any supportive care to any anybody so we need to make sure that whatever we do we are not uh, harming the patient more than doing good. So, so people have defined palliative care. There is a standard w, uh, 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 definition also. Uh, so it's an approach to improve the quality of life of the patients who are basically facing life-threatening illnesses and where uh, we uh, prevent uh, as much as agony as possible to, uh, to the patient and also uh, we try to reduce the pains and problems of the patients, which may be in different domains like physical, psychological, spiritual, and, and social. So it's, it extends, uh, if necessary, uh, the, the, uh, the, the support will uh, get extended even after death of the patient. Uh, so that bereavement support also need to, need to be provided. So it is an active total care of patients who's disease is not respond to, responding to curative treatment. So we know that HIV is not curable. So this is how it is different from uh, a patient who has other terminal diseases like cancer, for example. Once cancer is diagnosed, if it is stage four, if there are no not many treatment options, then you know that how it survives and, and doctors will give all that uh, five-year survival rates for the patients. And then based on that, they can estimate like how, how much a patient is going to live. But it is not safe to give that time, uh, especially in HIV. Uh, uh, first of all, it starts from the day of diagnosis. If you look at this graph, uh, for it, it shows two sections, green and blue. Uh, the green one is for cure, the diseases where there is a cure is possible. So after diagnosis, you provide uh, support uh, to the patient, and then at some point of time, patient will be cured of the disease. So there is a that journey of the patient, uh, 
of the of the treatment which we need to support but in hiv uh, once diagnosis is made we know that patient is going to die with hiv there is no cure as such which we are proposing so from this point until the patient dies which may be like one year two year 10 years 20 years god knows so we don't know when the patient is going to die so until that time how can we engage the patient in care and treatment so it is not just treatment but it involves care and the whole thing what we do in the art center and also outside the art center in the hospitals is called actually a palliative care which involves supportive and symptomatic symptom oriented treatment and also in case of hiv we give art which is which controls the hiv virus and then uh, when patient dies uh, after the death of the patient what the care needs to be provided to the patient's immediate family members and also uh, in relation to patient's burial and and maybe uh, uh, cremation and and and, and bereavement so that kind of care also is called as a is included in a in a continuum of care so uh, and it is not just related to the to the patient but more uh, important than that if not less important uh, is i think caring of the caregiver which is very very important uh, because it's not easy for anyone to uh, to be with the patient throughout their lives until they die and provide that kind of support which the, which the patient requires. Uh, there is a term called as caregiver burnout, which is very common and very natural, I guess. It is, it is not easy. And things or times have changed. There was a time when we used to have a joint families and big houses where uh, people used to take care of each other. But now when pe people have more and more nuclear families, there is like three or four people in a, in a, in a house and where there are children who go to school and there is a wife who is taking care of husband or husband taking care of wife and 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 there is a small space they they live in and then all this has to be managed by a caregiver who is not actually prepared to do so so it is not easy for the caregiver to provide similar quality of uh, care to the patients especially when they are uh, at home uh, and uh, throughout their life until their deaths. So it requires support. And we as a unit who work in the RT center can play very important, a very important role in providing that kind of support. So, uh, and everything is not expected from us, but we should be able to manage the entire, uh, entire care continuum where we need to uh, approach different groups of people maybe experts or uh, uh, doctors or, ref, or 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 uh, maybe like some hospices or min hospitals so um, insurance companies or maybe like uh, whatever so whatever the patient uh, requires we can coordinate all those those things to help the patient out to live through all these things so the the point here uh, i wanted to make was uh, that uh, the terminal care is towards the end of life when we know that nothing is working and that is called as terminal care, which can be like, I think it's uh, best provided, can be best provided at home or hospice. And there is a bereavement uh, exercise, which is after death of the patient. And before the terminal care, the entire thing from the diagnosis until that time is, uh, will be included again in palliative care. So uh, there are like, few basic principles which we need to like follow when we provide uh, this kind of care it needs to be family or patient centered uh, which means that uh, we will provide all those things what are required by the patients and not just and and which is best for the in the interest of patients sometimes it is important to decide uh, even for the families where to stop uh, uh, because with with this advances in medicines we have all these big hospitals and plus patients are having insurance uh, with them so the relatives would want to treat their patients until the time they die so they and many of the patients they die on ventilators and many of the patients they die, die on big corporate hospitals and where where it is a financial burden on, on the families and where it is a uh, it is not easy for 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 uh, most of the uh, families, especially in 
uh, HIV groups. So I'm not saying that those things are not important. What I'm trying to say is that uh, one should be able to decide uh, at what time, uh, uh, what is that appropriate time to stop uh, um, expecting that everything will uh, reverse and patient will again become normal. So again, this is a very important decision and no one in the patient's family will be able to take this decision because there is a lot of emotional involvement from the other side. But uh, from the technical side, I think we can uh, uh, we can assess the situation properly and we can help the patients and, and caregivers and relatives to take that decision. And there are various reasons why some, some of the families, they, they do so. There is society pressure and there are different kinds of pressures which they act under. So it, it, it actually is a joint effort where uh, our role is to uh, help the patients and families to take that, that, that decision, so the, which will help them uh, in helping the patients in, in what is the like, most important thing at that stage of the disease. So these are various components. Uh, pain management, especially uh, those patients who have, for example, cancers or malignancies and disseminated malignancies, there is a metastasis uh, happen, for example, in, in bone, which is really pain, painful. So uh, management of pain uh, will be like primary part of uh, the palliative care because it directly affects the quality of life. Then symptomatic management, for minor uh, symptoms or sometimes which will be very distressing for the patients. The nutritional support, uh, what kind of nutrition uh, need to be provided and, and how it needs to be given to the patient. Then psychosocial support, spiritual support might be very important for many people. Then end of life care and bereavement counseling. So these are various components. So we can go through like each of them uh, quickly. Uh, again, like I said, I'll not go in details of drugs and doses and durations and all that, which you can al al always, there is nothing to uh, uh, explain in that. It is just about like picking and choosing right things for right patients. But I think as a concept, it is, it is important for, uh, especially for ART medical officers and ART team, I, I should say, to, to, to realize that where we stand in, in this entire exercise. Otherwise, this specific thing can be just theoretical. This, this type of presentation can be just theoretical where there is a like, okay, we will know more about these things. But it is not just a, a, a theoretical topic in my opinion, even though you see patients on outpatient basis. But I think it is important when it comes to coordination and engagement with other stakeholders or other uh, uh, partners in this, this whole effort. And, and, and that's where we our, our uh, assessment of uh, um, you know, patient's miseries and, and maybe like uh, what kind of uh, management the patient requires. So that is really helpful for the patients to, and families to take that decision. So in, in terms of pain management, uh, first of all, we, we determine the severity, site and nature of the pain. Uh, if there is any infection that needs to be obviously managed with uh, whatever appropriate treatment and if there is and pain grading needs to be done every time or every day so that we can we can document that grading to see how the management is working so there are different types of grading uh, uh, tools which people use so this is a uh, uh, to assess the uh, characteristics uh, in, 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 in pain assessment, like uh, uh, PQRST, just to remember, uh, there's an acronym. So in uh, palliative factors, what makes uh, the pain better or worse in, in patients? How exactly it is like if pricking or burning or what, what type of pain, uh, if it is radiating to any other uh, site and how severe it is in, in like today, how severe it is, how, and that can be charted out. And uh, maybe is there any any time when it uh, it comes and goes, or it is continuous? It, if it is related to sleep, or when the patient is awake, all those things uh, need to be um, considered. Then uh, these are like various scales uh, for pain assessment. One of the various common, like very commonly used scale, is a visual analog uh, scales where patients are shown these pictures and asked to uh, point the finger or, or, or choose uh, 
how is it today or now to to say that uh, if the patient is more or uh, or less and if that is documented then we can see if the if it is improving not improving and and based on based on this we can decide like what kind of treatment the patient might be required and um, many of you might also be knowing that there are these days pain management centers and there are specialists who actually manage pains uh, this is one of the sub specialties in uh, uh, amongst those who are anesthetists so those who are anesthetists they also there are some of them choose to actually work in pain management uh, clinics or they run pain management clinics so as an art medical officers in those patients if if you know some some of them or can and can refer the patients to these uh, clinics that also will be really helpful for them so um, so, so the treatment modalities <clears throat> we can uh, uh, advise the patients to take patient, um, pain medications or uh, painkillers by uh, by mouth or uh, by intramuscular route or it can be also by clock that uh, how frequently it needs to be taken what needs to be repeated and what not to be repeated and then uh, before the pay, before the effect of one uh, pain medication or painkiller ends before that the second dose should come in so that's how the uh, doses are uh, managed so there are broadly two types like opioid and non opioid type of analgesics now there is one one thing which always goes in our minds that uh, this opioid anal analgesics uh, can pay, the dependency is one issue with this that uh, if that is a problem and that is that makes many many prescribers hesitant to use opioid uh, that uh, it might make the patients dependable on on opioid use but it doesn't matter much in in the person who is dying so if it is a end of life care and if the if the patient is pain uh, then we have to use opioid so if we are not confident in using uh, some of the drugs like this then uh, there is always uh, a good way to uh, get uh, consult someone and and decide if this needs to be used so uh, but again uh, there is no need to again uh, use multiple analgesics here so you can give one drug uh, from opioid and non opioid groups like trim tramadol for example that is an opioid uh, analgesic that can be used it has its own side effects uh, though the sometimes patient don't want to take them and and then you can decide that which is the drug patient is uh, more suitable uh, to 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 be used for and morphine for example it's a, it's an it's an approved opioid by who so but it needs needs to be used at 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 uh, that stage where it is required the most so 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 codeine uh, uh, if you want to use then uh, uh, it can be again used with the other uh, non steroid anti inflammatory like aspirin but it needs to be alternately uh, used um, so this who gives a three step pain relief analgesic ladder uh, mild moderate and severe so patients can travel from one stage to another so based on which stage the patient is uh, in mild or moderate or severe based on that we need to pick and choose so in in mild stage we usually use non steroidal anti inflammatory plus adjuvants is like supportive uh, uh, treatments and then mo in moderate we and and severe we use uh, opioid based uh, analgesics so it can be given by ladder which means you can increase the dose or frequency uh by by clock by mouth or or maybe injectables or maybe like based on the uh, patient and these are some of the examples uh, examples of some of the drugs which we use like acetaminophen aspirin ibuprofen diclofenac and and so on and their uh, dosage schedule and these are uh, opioid especially for cancer uh, patients uh, mainly like terminal patients with metastasis where the pain is really difficult and making the patient's life miserable for example and in those cases we have to use uh, uh, injectable and or oral uh, opioids both are available uh, so again like i said morphine is also available in immediate use controlled use or sustained use um, and and uh, or suppository uh, similarly oxycodone and like i said uh, these drugs Uh, have their own side effects 
And one of the main concern many of us share is dependency, which we need not be that concerned in a terminally dying uh, patient. So uh, no one should make any delay in starting pain management uh, with this fear uh, if, if patient is uh, suffering in front of you. So again, there are various types of NSAIDs commonly used are Brufen and or Diclofenac, and there are other also which we, which we use. Uh, common side effects are GI toxicities, ulceration, bleeding, and um, and we need to uh, pick and choose carefully which uh, antibiotic or which NSAID and what dose needs to be used. And uh, in opioid, also the short life is or or, or their half life is very small, uh, uh, especially morphine is just two hours. So based on uh, severity of pain, uh, one needs to decide when the next dose should go so that there is a no, no gap between the two doses so that patient is always comfortable. So drugs need to be carefully selected, their doses and their duration and their mode of, uh, in, mode of uh, uh, the way we give uh, dose to the patient that needs to be carefully selected. And if there are some complications or, or, or side effects that need to be again uh, managed well. So there are uh, many non-pharmacological therapies which can be provided, uh, but uh, please be very careful while advising those. Uh, like I said, in our uh, communities, uh, people do every crazy thing to get rid of pain. Uh, so uh, we need to be careful. And like I said, remember that basic principle of do no harm. Uh, so everything which is uh, soothing to the patients can be tried, um, uh, right from uh, some massages or thermal therapy like hot, hot bags and cold bags, or maybe some um, uh, uh, spiritual uh, support or maybe a recitation of some of the religious scriptures or, or whatever. So whichever is helpful for the patient can be, uh, uh, can be used. Uh, to to make them feel better, um, and there are some special issues like uh, if if the pain is because of involvement of some nerve endings at the superficial level, so there is some burning sensation, then we can use those uh, drugs which are uh, basically used to uh, cause or reduce those specific symptoms, like. Uh, uh, pre gabaline uh, here. So, and also there are many other drugs which we commonly use. If it is because of uh, muscle uh, issues, we can use diazepam to, to relax the muscles. If it is like a, a herpes zoster, we can always uh, use uh, uh, drugs like uh, amitriptyline, uh, which are uh, again used to reduce all these symptoms. Um, again, bone pain, ibuprofen. There are so it depends on uh, if there is any specially special problem which we are addressing. Based on that, we can pick and choose drugs. And some pains are due to pressure, uh, like there is a tumor which is causing a pressure, and because of which there is a pain. Then uh, we can carefully use steroids to reduce that pressure. For example, if there is something pressuring the spinal cord or maybe nerve end endings or, or, and that is causing some symptoms to reduce or decompress that nerve, we use steroids. So steroids can be used in these situations to, which ultimately will reduce or deal with the uh, pain. So it also will require some kind of emotional uh, support or physical methods or cognitive methods like distraction or prayers, which is really important in, in our communities, basically in India. Uh, where uh, uh, people feel comfortable with all these things. So uh, we are not imposing what we feel to for, for them, but whatever they like to do that we, our job is to support uh, them in that. Then uh, other symptom management, like there are some common symptoms which we can uh, manage in this situation, like nausea, vomiting, because patients invariably will be on so many medications at this stage, and there are so many side effects of these medications. So those need to be managed with the, unfortunately, some other treatment, uh, like some other pills, uh, which patients will have to take, or and, and or, or uh, like some other home remedies, which are related to like diet and drinks, what patients need to take to, to feel more less 
nauseating, for example, some spells are really bad for the patients, which we usually don't feel that bad. But if you are sick, uh, it's difficult to eat even the regular things. And, and those uh, things which uh, can cause problems like coffee, alcohol, obviously these things need to be avoided in, in these situations. Uh, and anti routine antibiotics like domperidone or ondansetron or uh, similar drug. There are so many other drugs which are used to uh, deal with vomiting. Uh, this we we usually say this as a very like common symptom, but this is can be terrible in in patients because unless you deal with this problem, patient will not be able to eat, and then everything will be linked with that. Like uh, that's why it is really important to take care of all these uh, small symptoms as well. Mouth ulcers are again similar. So uh, if it is causing pain, so that uh, pain need to go off uh, where we can use like dention wallet or Zyte or many other uh, treatments. If it is because of any specific infection like Candida, we need to treat that infection with antifungals like fluconazole. Uh, and then if it is only because of ulcer or maybe if it is herpes, then we may have to use acyclovir. So if there is any specific illness that need to be treated with anti with specific treatment, if it, if it is required, if not, then maybe like multivitamins and there are many other things which we use. And sometimes steroid also will be required to treat, treat after ulcers. So uh, all these things will, uh, uh, again, uh, it is because it is uh, related to swallowing and pain in mouth. So we'll also we'll have to see that what diet patients can take and uh, uh, how we can maintain the hydration and all those things are uh, important. So these are some of the uh, anti-emetics and, and their uh, examples and classes and their uh, dosing schedules which you can pick and choose based on the availability and, and need. Uh, hiccups is another problem which many of the patients, uh, especially those who are terminally ill and maybe like cancer patients and, uh, and those who are having some tumors, they come up with uh, this issue. It is basically due to irritation of diaphragm. Uh, maybe because of involvement of phrenic nerve or maybe uh, some some like kind of physical distress. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the regular, the uh, uh, manners to stop hiccups can be used. Uh, uh, for example, drinking cold water and eat crushed ice. So there are many things which can be used at home, which can reduce this. Uh, there are some treatment also, which are advised like uh, haloperidol, uh, which is, Again, it, it can be helpful in, in many patients, but many patients won't get relief. It depends on the cause of hiccups. And, uh, and unfortunately, in some patients, it can be chronic. And unless you treat the cause, it won't go off. And it is very uh, uh, difficult time for the patients sometimes to, to get over it. And But we, our job is to, again, provide support and advice like pulling uh, knees to chest and lean forwards to compress the chest so that that irritation uh, lessens down and patient feels better. Bed source is again so so common and uh, and this is something which which can be avoided and which should be avoided uh, and this should be predicted the moment patients get better bedridden. Uh, and this should be very well uh, expected, and 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 all efforts need to be taken that uh, it 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 can it can be avoided. So uh, we can suggest like the the uh, water beds or 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 or, or those, those kinds of beds where the uh, patients will feel better, and then then frequent change of positions. Uh, apply something to the skin so that it can be avoided for long durations. If the if there are any uh, tumors that can be specifically taken care of, if there is heat or or, or uh, uh, humidity, so that need to be addressed uh, with uh, talcum powders and and things like that. So all necessary things which can be which can help the patient to avoid bed sores bed sores need to be done, and if patient gets them, then they, they need to be managed with, again, uh, change of uh, positions to avoid pressures and, 
And if it is false smelling, treating them with uh, specific treatments like sometimes metronidazole powder or maybe other important things. So this is again something which need to be avoided. And if you find it, you, it need to be uh, treated. Now, uh, end of life care, uh, which need to be very distinct from palliative care, which we have discussed uh, so far. So in which we know that patient is going to die, but it is ob obviously, uh, obviously everyone is going to die. So, but uh, when, when, when we know that patient is deteriorating now on a, in, in, on a downward slope, then what all what all are those things which are required for the patients? Like I said in the in the beginning, we need to uh, also know that when to stop aggressive treatment and when to accept that now uh, we cannot do much, and uh, which will save patients agony and discomfort, which will help families also to accept this this thing in a immediate uh, future which will save a lot of money of the patient and also it will make things uh, smoother for the person who is dying which is more important uh, uh, there are uh, the dying patients may have a lot of worries like about their families about their kids and about their what they are going to uh, uh, leave in this world after they die so many things like making will is important for example and 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 all these things all these troubles which are there in the in the patient's mind need to be discussed so that these one kind of and and many of the in many of the situation what happens is relatives will come us and come to us and tell us that okay we know that the patient is dying but please don't tell the patient so patient will not know until the time he goes on a ventilator in the in some hospital corner and patients will die so they will not get a chance to prepare for their own death which is, in my sense, uh, my opinion, it is, it is not uh, right. So if someone is dying, that person has the right to know that he or she is dying. And then uh, they need to be uh, supported enough to prepare themselves for their own death. So it is important to talk to the families and, and make them understand that why it is important to discuss and disclose this, this to, to the patient. And uh, there is, one, no one should make any false promises to the patients because they are the one who are actually going through all this. So you, you should not be, on the other hand, one should not directly say to the patient, okay, you are anyhow going to die. But obviously there are ways to be sensitive of this, uh, this whole thing and help the person to understand the current situation and what might be the possible future. So there are uh, specialists in, 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 in doing this, but, uh, but I think as a as a uh, as a medical officer or a technical specialist in HIV, uh, it's very important for us to realize that human uh, 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 situation where people need uh, this kind of support, and we are in a good position to provide that kind of support. So the whole purpose of providing end of life care is to make death peaceful. Uh, comfortable and dignified for the patient and for the uh, caregiver. So psychological support and spiritual support is very important. And mainly uh, when a person comes and if a person is religious and if a person is near to death, the uh, every obviously religious and spiritual support is really important and helpful in those patients. So try to talk to the caregivers and to the patients again, talk about all those uh, good things which they have done in their lives and, and all those kinds of emotional and social support is required. So now I'm sure that many of you might have seen this uh, practically with your close relatives. And, and, and if you have seen that, so you uh, understand that better that how helpful it is for someone from who can see it from outside, like objectively from outside and can help the, the caregiver in going through, in, through that, that phase. So it is uh, very important. We will be in a best position to understand this uh, technically or clinically, and then also objectively advise uh, them what can be like best mode of uh, treatment or care uh, for uh, specific uh, patients. And like I said, um, caregiver burnout is very common and very natural. 
so caregiver if they behave if they don't behave well with us i think we need to make an effort to understand that from where this is all coming and if we we can address all some of those things obviously we will not be able to address everything but if we can address some of those things like sub and if, if someone is struggling financially if there are any organizations we can tie them up with who can help these kinds of patients that will be again in the best interest of patients and their families and like kids for example their education there are so many people who 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 actually support uh, uh, children's education free of cost so we can help them finding out these things so these are like some something which can be done like beyond our regular scope of work but this is something which is uh, very helpful for those patients who actually are experiencing uh, this phase of their life so provide psychological and spiritual support uh, support the family and especially caregiver identify who how many caregivers a family has if they have enough information of patient's condition and also their own conditions and and what is the prognosis or how the patient can proceed further in their Uh, disease all those things need to be discussed with the primary caregiver and also identify if there is any if there is additional caregivers and if there are groups unfortunately because of this nuclear family system there are not many people at home also to to speak with and 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 that is why all this uh, like the newer version of uh, extended family is uh, having these uh, is is group therapies where people similar people come together and talk to each other which was not there in the past but uh, this is how it works uh, now that's my like personal uh, uh, opinion I, i don't know if if that is right or wrong but uh, I, i think if 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 it is if if we are close to if the patient is close to all those uh, uh, families or have support from friends and families that is most i think desired by the person who is dying uh then um, all those comfort me- measures like uh, to 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 take care of the skin to take care of uh, oral cavity hygiene uh, eyes and because the patient is not taking bath then cleaning the uh, body and then uh, cleaning the uh, 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 urine and then then stool and and all those using diapers adult diapers all those things are uh, um very basic but important and also will require that kind of hand hold hand holding and and some kind of basic training is required for caregivers uh, at this stage then um um also to 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 realize that when the patient is dying people need need to know what happens when the person dies and and what needs to be seen if the patient especially are at home uh then what are the signs of death uh, we we all know but this is all uh, because we are not there to provide all this kind of support it is important for us to talk to the caregivers also about all these things and what to do in what what phase for every small thing at this stage they should not run to the hospitals because they, they need to know that if if it is beyond uh, beyond uh, beyond a point where we can cannot do much uh, for for those patients at that stage we need to uh, uh, help them out in that uh, specific way um then i like i said uh, palliative care in children is not very different but it is not same it is much more emotionally difficult for the caregiver than providing a care to adult so imagine like 5 years 10 years old kids with physical pain and discomfort and and then having all those lesions on their body and their they are like uh, a pair as a parent it's how difficult it is to see uh, the, your own kids in that 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 situation and help helping them out uh, through their uh, this phase of life and helping them out and dying peacefully so uh, again as i said it starts from uh, uh, the day of diagnosis but uh, thanks to art uh, it has made uh, a huge difference in quality of life of children and adults both where patients can live uh, free from uh, 
opportunistic infections and all these uh, infections for a long time uh, and can live almost a near normal life with uh, specific treatments. Uh, but if if there is a uh, if there is a time where we get patients where nothing more can be done, then that is again much more difficult time for anyone. In, in, even in fact, if from the day one it is difficult for parents to take care of HIV positive kids, but again, uh, as I said, we uh, can be that team who can look at all these uh, issues objectively and and decide or help the families to decide what is best for their, their child. So pediatric palliative care is a specialized comprehensive care approach for children uh, living with life-limiting and life-threatening illnesses. So it is, like I said, it is not very different from, from uh, adult care in terms of like providing that, that kind of support. But again, role of pediatrician is really important here uh, because there are many issues which are not that important in adults, which are uh, important in pediatrics, uh, in, in children, especially related to age, for example, like food. Uh, if the child is uh, very small or, or, or it's, they, they cannot explain themselves. They cannot uh, say that how much pain they are in. They, they cannot express their emotional needs. So they just know how to cry, for example. Like in these situations, it is much more difficult for the treating uh, physician or treating team, and also for the families to, to, to deal with these situations. So that is why it is uh, more than routine support is required. So mutual trust uh, and um, emotional and cognitive de development of child, distraction, care at home, and maybe like talking to these children who can actually talk to, talk, so, so it is not necessary that every child need to be uh, dealt with uh, thinking that they don't understand things. The elder children, they understand things. They know what is life. They know what is death. Sometimes more than the way we, we see it because they have a short lifespan. And since the time they know about HIV, they know that what this disease is and then how they might end. And if they come to that, point, they will know much more than, than us about the reality of life and what they are going to like uh, deal with. So it is not, so first of all, we should stop lying to anyone. Uh, I think it, there are ways to talk to uh, patients uh, as per their needs, what they want, and then accordingly, we need to advise uh, them uh, without lying, without, again, be very brutal and, and very straightforward, but there is a middle way where we can be sensitive towards things and uh, we can keep children engaged in what they like to do, like painting or maybe like talking or maybe whatever they, they need and they can be uh, uh, provided. Uh, and these are the situations where there are a few things which we already do, like providing profile access uh, for, for opportunistic infections treatment. But again, at this point of time, it is difficult for them to take medications. It is those who, who, who have dealt with kids, they, they, they know that how difficult it is sometimes to give a one tablet to, uh, to, to a child. And, uh, and, and in this, these situations with HIV, with a lot of pill burden, it's easy to prescribe things on paper. Uh, and also it is easy to purchase medications. Uh, but now to get them down the throat of the the child is it's it's uh, i think one of the most difficult things sometimes so 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 i uh, i i think it's it's all about like uh, awareness of the situation to to know that what is happening at that stage and as a physician or as a, a team member of an art team how best we can help the patients and to help them uh, in the best possible way, we need to make ourselves ourselves equipped in understanding those situations objectively well, and then deciding what exactly needs to be done in what situation, without having a personal bias, without having any any anything, uh, uh, and and also there is like there are situations where we as a caregiver need to tolerate more because we also have our. Uh, uh, 
um, frustrations and, and I would say burnout situations after so, seeing so many patients. Sometimes um, caregivers who come to the ART center and even patients, they don't, don't talk to ART teams properly. Uh, but if we know that from where that anger is coming, I think it is it becomes easy for 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 both providers and patients to to find that middle ground where things can be still social. So I, I guess it is it is about like basic human uh, and ethical uh, values. Okay, so so essential components for pediatrics or so pain management, symptom management, and psychosocial and spiritual support. Um, so pain, like I said, it is difficult for patients uh, to express their uh, pain in 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 a, in, a, uh, in words. So it is there are specialists, especially pediatricians and, and pain management specialists. They'll be uh, they they'll be able to understand this more than many of us, I guess. So uh, then uh, prescribing the appropriate management uh, or treatment medications to these uh, kids, and then. Uh, there is, like I said, there is a fear of using opioid for its uh, risk of dependency, but when it is, ne it needs to be used, it, it, it should be used. So correct use of analgesic medicine will relieve the patient's pain in most of the situation. So um, there are many non-pharmacological uh, measures uh, that need to be taken, which are age appropriate, uh, active distraction, or maybe some games, or maybe like just being there with the, with the kids, playing along with them. It's not easy to do every day. That is the whole point. So you can do it one or the other day, but if 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 you don't know when the person is going to die or when the person is going to be uh, better, so it's hard to 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 provide that sustained support uh, till the end. So I think uh, uh, it's a it's a the the caregivers themselves will require a lot of hand holding to go through this phase and. Every caregiver who walks into the ART center will or deals with some or the other of similar situations in their lives because it's not easy to be there, there with someone who is actually going through this difficult phase. Then uh, symptom management, uh, again, it is not very different from what we discussed for adults. And uh, uh, psychosocial or spiritual support uh, like I said, uh, it, it can be a team or it can be a multidisciplinary team which provides all this kind of support. And wherever the patients require some specialist uh, referrals that we need to provide. Uh, Home-based care, um, uh, like I highlighted in the beginning that it is important to uh, decide when the person should go home. If, if we know that there is nothing better can happen in terms of like uh, patient survival, uh, and if there is enough, in, if patient wants to go home, I've seen this these situations, unfortunately, uh, with people having money and insurance schemes and all that, they want to provide like best care to their patient in a best hospital they have in the city. But uh, if you ask the patient, patient wants to be at home. And then everyone knows that patient is going to die. So best possible uh, solution for that situation should be, the patient should go home and die at home peacefully. Again, uh, this decision is difficult to take for the families uh, for many reasons. It is not just about that everyone wants to um, do the aggressive treatment for the patients, but sometimes it is because of many other pressure of the surroundings and, and whatever. So uh, so we we can help them out in making that decision for them. So even the caregiver can say that because the ART team said so, it is good for the patient also to go home. Because also the many of the patients, they want to be with their loved ones and no one wants to be to die in an ICU with a ventilator without, without seeing their um, close ones at the time of death. So, so imagine how difficult it is for, for that patient. So it is important to, take the decision when to go home and, and when we, they can be with their close relatives and friends and live those last moments with, with their loved ones. So for caregivers, again, uh, um, who are providing care to the HIV, basic knowledge of HIV, its transmission routes, uh, so that the 
uh, infection can be avoided and, and prevented. All those things need to be explained and edu uh, education need to be given to the caregivers, especially the primary caregivers, uh, so that they can avoid injuries to themselves and, and provide all those necessary things which are required uh, uh, for, for the uh, patients at home. Um, there are like few basic things which uh, need to be included in the kit of of the uh, of the patients, like gloves, for example, clean cotton, uh, soap, scissors, uh, some lotions or creams, and bleaching powder and talcum powders and petroleum jellies. So uh, those are the things which need to be uh, 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 which can be actually provided. And then uh, then few basic treatment for everything they need not come to uh, a doctor because it's not easy to 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 again uh, do a consultation so if if they know that they are going to they are uh, like terminally ill patients uh, so those basic uh, medications which we can actually the knowledge of that basic uh, medications need to be provided to the caregivers so that they can help them out at at home itself they need not like run around with, because also it is taking patients to the caregiver is such a difficult task. So um, it's important that uh, those caregivers need to be educated. I remember there is a, there was one organization in Chennai, I think it was caring for caregivers, CC3 or something. I don't know if it still works or not. There may be like many other organizations where uh, they, they used to uh, have this, social groups of caregivers who have terminally ill patients at their homes. And they used to invite them together for their meetings once in a month or once in some frequency. And they, they teach them how to make beds, how to change the diapers, how to get, treat common uh, illnesses at home and how to provide uh, food, like how to take care of catheters, nasogastric tubes, and basically to, to teach and train them how best it can be done, because it is not possible for everyone to have a full-time nurse at home uh, when they when they they close one again because money is most important factor in providing palliative and terminal or uh, end of life care, and uh, and and that is why it is important to uh, like assess the situation and 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 prepare the patients and families well, and obviously sometimes caregivers will require some some break where we'll have to find like mandatory breaks for caregivers and have some other uh, alternatives for them to, to uh, again, have these group therapies uh, will help them to reduce their stress. So that was the presentation. Uh, and I know that this is, uh, uh, this is sometimes uh, looks like it is a not relevant topic, but I think, um, in, in current scenario in HIV, I'm saying, because we, we don't see this these patients as an ART medical officer or ART team who is providing outpatient services. But uh, this is still real in, in many of the HIV positives who, who, who whom we, we don't know what happens to them. Many of the patients who die, we don't know what happens before they die. So, but this can happen with each and every patient. That is why I think it is important for us also in the ERT team to know how systematically we can provide palliative and end of life care especially uh, the home based care what advices can be given what can be those messages which we need to actually give to the caregivers and how they can learn how can make how can we make this learning better if we can organize some of these meetings of caregivers at our art center if there can be some kind of ic material at the walls of the art center through which they can learn some new things uh, these are the things which are not like part of mainstream treatment as such or priority treatment as such in our day-to-day -day practice in the RT centers. But uh, this is uh, very real for every patient, I think, because everyone is going to die. And we don't know outside the RT center what happens before they die, what happens in the hospitals. So whenever they are in the hospital, I think we can help them to uh, prepare for these situations. I hope that is useful, and I think uh, it's uh, it, it will be useful for you to save these slides to refer back to when you want to choose 
and pick medications and then doses and 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 kids and some specific advices i think these slides can be really helpful so that's it for me uh, thank you for your patient listening thank you yeah, thank you so much sir any questions from the participants please feel free to unmute your mic or you can even type your questions in the chat box any questions regarding palliative care so i don't think there are any questions oh, can we go ahead with the feedback form please the feedback form is now visible on your screen please go through it go through all the four questions and answer them requesting all the participants to please answer the feedback form Okay, then so we can end the feedback poll now. Thank you. So, can we conclude the session now? Sorry. Can we conclude the session? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.